Thing. Order! Order! And you are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! People living with illness or disability or who are struggling with the benefit system are more, most likely to rely on food banks. That's according to research carried out by Harriet Watt University for the charity The Trussell Trust. It described 94% of people who use food banks as destitute, with many living on less than £50 a week. In 2010, the Trussell Trust handed out 41,000 food parcels. By last year, that had increased to 1.6 million. Our social affairs correspondent, Michael Buchanan, reports. I, I mean, I was bedridden for a few weeks. And, yeah, that's when it sort of started to hit that I needed to do something. Misfortune can strike at any time. Donna Kennedy was working as a nursing auxiliary when she had too many strokes. Unable to work and with little income, money ran out for the single mum, forcing her to go to her local food bank. It's been that person that's been providing for the family for so long and then all of a sudden it's just through illness it's been taken away. Donna remembers clearly her first trip to the food bank, driving around, uncertain if she'd go in, sitting outside in tears, feeling embarrassed. Feeling degraded, feeling sort of, has it had to come to this? And you know, it just wasn't, it just didn't seem fair that it had come to this. Hi girls. At the food bank in County Londonderry where Donna now volunteers, demand for help has increased each year since it opened in 2015. Here, as elsewhere in the UK, problems with benefits are a key reason people need food. The initial five week wait for universal credit creating particular difficulties. A lot of the families that we would see come to the food bank have tried to survive for five weeks. They have borrowed from family members, from neighbours, from whoever they can to survive. But actually when the benefit then comes in, they owe money back to those people and then they find themselves in difficulties and they've had to come to the food bank at that stage then. Today's research is intended in part to tackle the argument that more people are using food banks because there are more of them. While that was a small factor, the major reasons people needed help were to do with a lack of benefits and living with an illness or disability. Single parents were also at much greater risk. Hunger isn't about food, it's about money. And it's about how people do not have enough to afford the absolute basics. Um, we found that the average household income um, of somebody who's been referred to a food bank after they've paid the rent is just £50 a week. And that is leaving people facing real destitution. There's no more cereal, so I have the last piece of toast. Luckily, Mum isn't hungry. This children's book was recently published about a family in need, a sign of how normal food banks have become. Mum doesn't like going to the feed bank, but I do. It's a no money day helps explain why more than half a million food parcels were given to children last year. The topic is familiar to this school, as they collect supplies for their own local food bank. Maybe one day, me and Mum won't have to worry, but tonight, because of kind people, our tummies are full. The government has emphasised that they spend £95 billion annually on what they call the welfare safety net, but the increasing use of food banks suggests it's not enough for many people. Michael Buchanan, BBC News. One in 50 households across this country has used a food bank over the last year, and many of them are living with illness or disability. The shocking state of poverty in the United Kingdom has been starkly revealed tonight in a three-year-long study by the Trussell Trust, which says that a decade ago, it ran just 57 food banks. Today, that figure has soared to more than 400. And it found that the overwhelming majority of people who depend upon food handouts just to get by are classed as destitute. Our social affairs editor, Jackie Long, has this report. An early start for Gemma Carter, making sure six-year-old Freya is ready for school. Gemma is an almost textbook example of the people identified in the State of Hunger report. A lone parent on benefits struggling with debt. She doesn't need a university study to tell her what life is like when a food bank seems your only option. I never ever thought I'd have to use a food bank to feed my children or even survive, sorry. Um, but without them, I don't know where I'd be. 
there was weeks where I wouldn't eat. Like, my doctor used to have a go at me, and but I swallowed my pride, and I knew that I couldn't give what they needed, so I had to go somewhere for the help. But, yeah, I mean, without them, I don't know where I'd be. I really don't. Gemma works part-time as a carer, though she's currently on maternity leave, but her income is supplemented by benefits. She says her problems began when she was switched from the old benefit system to universal credit. What would you say is the fundamental difference between the benefits that you were on before and universal credit? I could survive on the benefits I was on before. I didn't have any issues. With the universal credit, I mean, there's, it's just, it's horrible. It, it really is bad. Like, I can't, it's, they're just not getting the same life as other children. The question of who uses food banks and why has always been contentious. Today's research analyzes data gathered in the first year of a three-year study. According to the research, 94% of people at food banks are destitute. That's unable to afford basics like food, heat or lighting. 74% live in households affected by ill health or disability. And 77% of people referred to food banks are in debt through arrears, most commonly for their rent and council tax. The government have often said that the reasons people go to food banks are complicated. Today's research suggests it's really quite simple. Families left to live on £50 a week some people with no money at all in the days before they finally resort to going to a food bank. Critically, the research also suggests that benefits is one of the key drivers for people going hungry, something organisations like the Trussell Trust and many others say they've been trying to tell the government for years. Do you think in the past the government hasn't listened to what you're saying? don't believe what you're saying? I think there has definitely been aspects of that, that there is disbelief that so many people need food banks and I think it's now having the data from the Trust of Trust and other food banks that we're able to actually prove what we're seeing on the ground. The Department for Work and Pensions say they're taking today's report very seriously. The government announced this week they're lifting the freeze on working age benefits and they say they're making universal credit easier to access. Last month at her first select committee hearing, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions insisted it was working. Broadly, universal credit is now rolled out in every, um, in every, part, every job centre around the country, every part of the country. Uh, that's, uh, I think, broadly working well. There's more we can do. Uh, and I think a lot of that is about, again, how do we get people into the uh, front door uh, more quickly when they need help? But one of the MPs who grilled her was unconvinced. Heidi Allen, once a Conservative, who says she now regrets voting for benefit cuts, worries that this coming election could bring little change for people struggling at the very bottom. Because she came for a first evidence session with us um, at the Select Committee a couple of weeks ago, and it was like talking, I'm afraid to say, to a wall. Not interested at all in what we, an experienced committee who've been gathering evidence for years on this policy, she didn't appear prepared to listen. But she doesn't believe Labour's plan to scrap universal credit is the right answer either. But it has to be about evidence. I don't actually care what colour of government it is. Any policy needs to be based on evidence. I'm excited for school. I'm excited too. Back in Northampton as they head off to school, Freya's excited about her birthday coming up. But for Mum... That's more pressure. To tell a child they might not get something for Christmas is devastating. And, and the fact that it's her birthday next week makes it even harder. Well, now, the economist Esther Duflo was awarded this year's Nobel Prize for her work on identifying the causes of poverty in the developing world and finding solutions. In her new book, Good Economics for Hard Times, she argues that what she learnt in India and elsewhere has application in the Western world too. So when we met earlier, I asked her, given today's report on the use of food banks, whether such provision has now become an essential lifeline for many. It's a widespread and noxious misconception that people who rely on food, food banks or food stamps in the US or other form of assistance are uh, sponsors and lazy people. 
that misconception has indeed back to Victorian England, received a booster shot during the Margaret Thatcher or Ronald Reagan era, and is based on our idea that, look, you know, if, it's, if there is easy help available, why would people ever work? But in fact, in reality, what, we, what all the research shows is that, if anything, people underuse the benefits that they, could, that they could get, that the road to get to go to a food bank is paved with administrative hassles and with stigma and with shame. What this means is that, number one, the poor become desperate. What should be an accident in life becomes like a life-threatening situation. And some people never get out of it. There is a race of the death of despair from suicide, from overdose, uh, from opioids, etc., both in the US and, and in other countries as well. And in addition, it also scares the other people, <laughs> the people who think of themselves as being in the middle class, but both despise the poor in a way and are terrified of becoming like them. And that makes people extremely reluctant to embrace any sort of change or disruption, lest it disrupts the, the, the delicate equilibrium in which they live. And that does prevent us to advance a society and, and find solutions to our common problems. Can we say then that food banks, for example, are a valid test of poverty? We can say, and I think it has been demonstrated, that food banks play an essential role in keeping people together. Uh, we can also say that we have to rethink the system and saying, well, we shouldn't be thinking just about food banks. We can now start thinking about an entirely different way of conceiving of welfare, not as a temporary help when you really, really need it, but as a substantive part about how, as society, we are coping with disruption and the disruptions are going to keep coming with globalization and automation, etc. And we need to rethink about how do we want to organize our societies to help everyone deal uh, with the shocks that are going to come. Well, joining me now are Labour's Rosie Duffield, who sits on the Department for Work and Pension Select Committee, and the President of the Liberal Democrats, Baroness Sal Brinton. We did ask the Conservative Party, the Department for Work and Pensions, and the local Conservative MP for an interview. No one was available. Rosie Duffield, what would Labour do for people reliant on food banks right now? Well, first of all, isn't it disgusting that this is part of our kind of wallpaper in a way? This is our everyday language now, food banks. Five, six years ago, we hadn't really heard of them, and yet they're part and parcel of daily lives for many people and working people, and that in itself is disgusting. But you need to change the benefits system, Absolutely. so how will you do We've it? said we're going to scrap universal credit. I'm not going to pretend I know what's in our manifesto yet because I haven't seen it, but I hope we've got a much fairer system. We need to get rid of this five-week wait. We need to get rid of the benefits cap that's been around for far too long, and we need something in place that's going to work. I was on tax credits, and that system worked perfectly well for me as a working single mum. So something like that, again, might be the way around. Um, Baroness Brinton, what would you do? Well, we're clear that we would want to reform universal credit. It's gone wrong in the delivery. And what we want to ensure is that part of the Remain bonus that Joe Swinson has been talking about if we stay in the EU... The Remain bonus? The Remain bonus, because we're spending billions at the moment on preparing for getting out. We don't get any extra money out. from Remaining. No, no, but we are spending money that we'll, we'll stop spending... So what's if the Remain spend, bonus? Look, for example, all the extra there is money no bonus, on ports. There is no bonus, No, no, we'll, you can call it what you like. There is money oh, that will be back in public services. <laughs> it's a shorthand for actual money that will be available to us to spend on public services, like universal credit. We want to reduce the five-week wait to five days. We think it's appalling that it's five weeks. We also want to enshrine in law the right to access to food. And that means that any public service that provides benefits or other sort of support must not do so if it's going to impinge on an individual who receives benefits access to food. So it won't necessarily mean food vouchers or anything like that, but if the system isn't working and we know that universal credit is not working the way it should at the moment, the number of people, for example, in zero-hours contract jobs who are now actually having to use food banks is appalling. So particularly for young people on zero-hours contract, we will increase their hourly rate by about 20% minimum. So people will think there's not really any difference between you on this? I think there's so many things we can agree on here, and basically that's that the Tories have got this wrong and they've had a decade to start improving things. Children in England should not be living in poverty, and the Child Poverty Action Group are telling us that that's going to hit nearly 5 million. 5 million children by 2020. That's absolutely outrageous. But you've admitted in the past that 
the Liberal Democrat period in government damaged your credibility mm -hmm. with people on benefits, particularly disabled people? Well, as a disabled woman myself, I absolutely understand that. The problem has been in the implement implementation of universal credit, mm. where, particularly for disabled people, the one thing that we were told as the bill went through um, Parliament was that actually the new medical assessments would be mm. fairer. They are not fairer. They are appalling. But it's also your we credibility, would isn't it, given what you did in government? Well, I think... Support for the bedroom our, tax and all of that. You know, all, I mean? our, all our policies since then, and in fact, more importantly, the fact that poverty has increased substantially since the Conservatives were in charge on their own since 2015 absolutely demonstrates they keep rowing back on all the things that we wanted to do. We will continue to fight. We want to change universal credit. I accept the point that Rosie made that in, in the past some things work for some people, but the old system was extremely complex. What we need to do is to make a system that works for everybody, including stopping hunger. Can we touch on Brexit briefly because of Jeremy Corbyn's speech today? I mean, didn't his speech make clear that if you're a, a, a Lever, you really shouldn't vote Labour? Well, if you're a Lever, then presumably you quite like the deal because it does result in leaving. So you could vote for the deal, and that's the option we put in the, in the referendum. People. Yeah, well, we're, we're saying that if we get into power, we will put a referendum back and a people's vote. A lot of people don't agenda. think your version of Brexit, which would be in the customs union and pretty much in the single uh, market, is really Brexit. It's still that's leaving, though, isn't it? It's still a deal, and it's the best one that people might get if they really want to vote for a deal. I'm a Ramona, I always have been, so you know, I'm not hiding that fact, and I would like people to vote for So you don't really want leave, leave us Personally, to vote Personally, I think it would be a disaster for my part of Kent, yeah. Um, you're targeting her seat. Now, if you're supposed to be working together in some sort of, you know, stop a hard Brexit alliance, what, why are you trying to get her out? When she says get... she's a self-confessed Ramona. <laughs> Rosie is indeed a Remainer. The problem is Jeremy Corbyn, who is clearly a lever. And the Liberal Democrats in the run-up to this election are absolutely clear that we, we cannot support Labour candidates simply because we are not prepared to support Leave. I do hope that the position... I mean, we want people to vote for us, obviously, because we are very clear. Joe is the absolute strongest Remain candidate um, leader of any of the parties across England, Scotland and Wales. We're getting that message through. I think the point she made this morning in our launch is we're absolutely at a reset moment in our politics. Gone are the old days of this being about red and blue. We're actually at a point where politics can change for good. And I know that my party also hopes that will bring other changes to our democracy, part of which we've seen is completely broken in Parliament at the moment and, frankly, in the country. I mean, given... I mean, you, you said Ramona, not mm -hmm. me. Um, why aren't you in their party? Um, why aren't you one of those Labour MPs who I've been in left? Labour for such a long time and, you know, my values are very rooted in the history of the Labour Party. But actually, the problem, instead of sort of pitting the parties against each other... That's I think, an election, I'm I think. Afraid. No, I agree, obviously, <laughs> but I think the public are fed up with that sort of squabble between really like-minded people. And the problem I see is that it's the first-past-the-post system. Democracy should allow... You know, in Kent, I'm the That's only... Another Lib Dem policy. I'm the only Absolutely opposition is. MP in Kent, <laughs> and people should have the chance to have an opposition position MP or more of us and actually I'm afraid the Lib Dems will just split my vote if we're not careful and I'm determined that I won't happen so Rosie Duffield Baroness Selbins thank you both very much